Hey, welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today we're going to continue fabricating parts to put a 420cc big block engine in our street legal go-kart. So go grab some cold pizza, a warm beverage, and wipe that drool off your face. Wait, what? Uh, Okay, well let's start today off by building the steel engine support cradle. For the most part, the new cradle will be a copy of the old one, but with several improvements. Now one of the critical parts that we need to copy exactly is the upper bar that spans across the transmission adapter plate. This part sets the width of the cradle, and with the limited space we're working with, that's fairly important. So with all the critical dimensions recorded, it was time to start cutting the metal. And yes, I am using a face mask. Well, you get the idea. There's definitely a lot of parts to cut. Next, I set up a jig with some scrap 2x4s. The jig helps keep the cradle square during the preliminary welding process. Now, I'm using a Lincoln 135 MIG welder, which is one of the smaller welders available, but it seems to work fine for most of the stuff I weld. Yeah, I know. I should be wearing gloves. You can't tell, but right now it's winter in Michigan, and the garage is somewhat cold. Anyway, I noticed my automatic welding helmet is slow to react. Anybody else have problems with their welding helmet in the cold weather? At this point, the cradle's fully welded inside and out, but it's not finished. Now, this part here will eventually need to be cut out, and we'll get to that pretty soon. Anyway, it's time to start fitting the components so we can determine where the reinforcement struts need to be welded in. One of my concerns with this cradle is, it needs to be built for easy access to the sprockets, so we can test different drive ratios down the road. This part here is part of the support system for the input shaft bearing. I elected to make this part bolt-in rather than weld-in, and this is something I learned from my previous build. So now we're going to fabricate the rest of the support bearing. The idea is to mount the bearing to the aluminum plate, then somehow make it fit by drilling holes or something. Of course it helps to take measurements whenever possible. Anyway, according to the tape measure, the center of the bearing needs to be right about here. And from this point we can determine where the other holes need to go. Now as you can see the lighting in my garage is pretty good. The primary reason for decent lighting is of course for making videos. Anyway, the LED shop lights that I'm using are perfect for the camera, but they don't throw off enough light to power a solar calculator. So I'm guilty of using some modern witchcraft to do some of my calculations. Alexa, what's 4.54 subtract 0 .625? 4.54 minus 0 0.625 is 3.915. Alexa, what's 3.915 divided by 2? 3.915 divided by 2 is 1.9575. 1 1.9, 1 what? Repeat, Alexa, repeat. Alexa, repeat. Sorry, there is nothing to repeat. I reckon I'll buy a battery powered calculator. They say never use your calipers as a scribe, but I'm here to tell you, it'll be fine. So I do a lot of metal fabrication, and it's mostly as a hobbyist, but I also do some carpentry. Now my carpenter friends find it amusing that I cut wood to the third decimal point. It's a habit. So let's see how the bearing hanger fits. Eh, not too bad. Now I use nylock nuts for everything, but during the setups I use conventional nuts. So it looks like we can cut the input shaft right about here. And now a quick visit to the lathe to clean up the rough cut. 
At this point, we can start working out the details of the chain and sprocket system. Looks like we're going to need to do some more cutting. Now I'm cautious about cutting too much material from this area, so we'll do it in steps. I like to use high contrast paint pens to make my cut marks. Sharpies will also work, but sometimes they're hard to see. So this is what we ended up with. Now I still need to do some cleanup work on the right hand side, but for now we have enough open space to work things out. Now you can see the chain is actually fairly tight, and that's because I made up some aluminum shims to move the jack shaft bearings out about, I don't know, 3 eighths of an inch. Shims will definitely work for the basic adjustment, but we still need to deal with the chain slack. If you recall from the unboxing video, we're also going to be using an idler sprocket to help maintain chain slack. Now off camera I fabricated a prototype chain slack adjustment system. This is kind of the basic shape of what I need, but it's definitely not the final design. The idea behind this system is to use the input shaft as a pivot point, and the rest gets very complicated. So here's the basic idea, but we still need to refine this further. To give you a better idea of what's going on, let me go ahead and install this thing on the engine cradle. Now I'm taking a shortcut and installing the parts whole, but in the event of a sprocket change, this gizmo comes apart into smaller pieces and can be removed with the input shaft in place. On the older system, the engine and transmission adapter had to be removed from the car in order to change the larger sprocket, and I don't need to tell you that's a royal pain in the ass. Now as you can see, the idler sprocket is on the slack side of the chain and can pivot upward to tighten the chain. The adjustment mechanism will kind of go down here, and we'll sort that out when we get there. This prototype adjuster has some issues, and we're going to have to make it a lot longer in order to fit up some additional components. So let's just go ahead and build it, and you'll get the idea. Now let's go ahead and assemble this thing. Now this aluminum piece was split in two pieces so it can be easily removed. Although there's certainly a lot of parts, this system ended up costing about $40 to put together. Of course, that's not counting labor. Finally, this is the finished chain slack adjustment thingy, and it's huge. Some would say it's too big to fail, and I would agree. So off camera, I went ahead and installed this monster, and I have to tell you, it works great. Let's take a closer look. Now keep in mind, I haven't put any keys on the shafts yet, so nothing's really locked into place. 
The motor mount I ended up using is made for a Honda GX390 or a clone big block engine. I had to modify it quite a bit and designed it to bolt in place. The reason I'm not welding it on is because we'll still be running the smaller 212cc engine as we continue our experimentation. Oh yeah, and eventually we'll do the 670cc V-twin, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Right now I have the chain really tight, of course that's bad, and I know this, but it just shows you the adjustment system's capable of really cinching up the chain. To adjust the chain it's just a matter of loosening and tightening a few nuts, and this will work out really nice. Here's a shot of the bottom side. In order to change the large sprocket, the support bearing assembly unbolts and can be easily removed. Next, the two-piece aluminum arm can be split and then it can be slid out. And finally, the sprocket slides out. All said and done, it should take about a half hour or less to change the sprocket and that's a hell of a lot better than half a day. Now another thing that has to be considered is the length of the torque converter belt. The belt length is determined by the distance from the crankshaft center to the jack shaft center. The shims that I use to push the jack shaft out can cause a problem with how the torque converter works. So to combat this, you'll notice the engine mounts will allow the engine to slide back and forth, and that'll help compensate for any additional shims that may be added in the future. So I temporarily set the engine in place, and I have to tell you, this thing's real heavy. Anyway, the engine's rated for 13 horsepower out of the box, and I think I actually might believe that. Of course, that's with the restrictive muffler and the original air filter. Now the air filter doesn't look like it would cause too many problems as far as power goes, but it just ain't gonna fit. So it's possible that with the new custom exhaust and a different air filter, and of course some fiddling with the carburetor, we can probably add a few more horsepower even before we hit the street. Alexa, how fast can we get this car to go with a big lawnmower engine? I couldn't find an answer, but I'll notify you if I find one. Yeah, right. So I think I'll wrap this video up today and I'll get going on finishing the swap up in the next video. You're not going to want to miss the ending of the 420 big block Hemi swap. Trust me.